door open to pay attention for the next uh, few minutes. Um, welcome again. We're ready now. I'm the chairman of the evening. My name is Ian Redmond. I chair the April Lines. I'm also your sound engineer, which is why I have to rush up to the microphone. Uh, so we're going to record the evening, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, it will, either as it is, or perhaps in an age of form, uh, grace the website of the April Lines. So the purpose of this evening is really to have a discussion about what is a, a very topical issue. A topical because, as many of you will know, in February this year, the British government, uh, the level of the Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary, uh, and also with Prince Charles and Prince William and Prince Andrew, hosted a meeting of almost 50 countries, some at the head of state level, four presidents, I think, uh, and others at ministerial level, uh, to discuss the problem of the illegal wildlife trade and what these governments can do about it. It's been an issue throughout my working life. When I first went into the field in 1976, my first day turned out not to be watching gorillas and taking notes and their behaviour as I expected, but raiding a butcher's camp and coming back with bush meat. And the images you've been scrolling behind uh, on, on the screen uh, were an indication of some of the things over the years that I've been involved with, from the bush trade, the live animal trade, and even just passing through airports. If you've been on holiday to countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, but even around the world, you will often see bits of wildlife. And by wildlife, I'm talking about all living organisms, not just the big mammals that people think of, some people think of when you say the word wildlife. So there's clearly a fascination. People are fascinated by wildlife, and often they want to stimulate or feed that fascination by acquiring bits of it, either because it's interesting or it's cool or, or it, it gets them some kudos. And this has been a part of human nature for a very long time. I'm developing a, a, a paper, which I hope eventually to publish, where we talk a little bit about this because it seems to me that, that there are three C's in human nature which most parents want to encourage in their children and which are seen as a good thing. Curiosity. Of course we want people to be curious about the natural world. And we are naturally curious. You see something you haven't seen before and say, whoa, look at that. Ooh, what is it? And then compassion. If you see an animal suffering, if you see someone suffering, human or animal, you want to end that suffering. And you say, ah. And then there's comedy. We all enjoy laughing. Laughter brings us together. So anything you've got that makes people laugh is likely to be something that raises your social status. So this is what I term the ooh-ah-ha-ha-ha ah, ha, hypothesis. And curiously, those three non-verbal communications, ooh-ah-ha-ha-ha, ah, ha, ha, are the closest vocalizations that we make to the non-human primates, the great apes, that are our closest relatives. So why is that? Is it something that we have in common? We've all been curious about things and responded in that way. Does that hit some part of our basic primate brain and, and stimulate those things, curiosity or passion or, or humor? Food for thought. So we have tonight a distinguished panel of speakers. And I'll start in no particular order. Let's go with Ben first, because uh, Ben uh, Garrett is a primatologist, and uh, his brief blurb is up there. But what has made it particularly uh, interesting to the, the public at large recently is his television series that recently went out on BBC Four, and which I'm told is soon to be re shown on BBC Two. So that's, a, that's a, an indication of how well it went down. Um, where he's talking about bones, and bones are fascinating. They make people go, "Ooh, look at that!" They make people go, "Ah, oh, really?" Ear. But other non-verbal <laughs> communications are elicited. And, and I know from my early days working with mountain rulers that one of the threats that they faced was people who were living in the country who wanted to acquire skulls, either as souvenirs or to present to museums back home, doctors, serious professional people who wanted the kudos of having a skull in their town museum, say, presented by Dr. So and so. So it created a demand, which of course, Poachers are happy to supply. So how do we stimulate a curiosity in zoology and anatomy without pushing it into creating a market 
which then creates a demand, which will be fed illegally and likely unsustainably. We all know that some of the most endangered species on the planet were driven to extinction by museums collecting. You remember the story of the great orc, where they thought it was extinct. And then somebody found some, and musicians, museums sent people there to get specimens because they hadn't got one, and that was that. That was an interest in zoology leading to an extinction of the species. Then we have um, Professor Vincent Neiman from Oxford Brookes University, uh, who is a primatologist and who has done a lot of undercover and um, uh, research work in Southeast Asia looking at markets, looking at places where there is a thriving commercial trade in bits of wild animals. We have Christoph Schwitzer, Dr. Christoph Schwitzer from the Bristol Clifton Western England Zoological Society uh, and the Bristol Science um, Conservation Science Foundation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, All so the Bristol Society. <laughs> From Bristol Zoo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, whose job is, at least whose institution's job is to stimulate people's interest in wildlife without making them want to either possess it or do anything to it which drives it to extinction. And we might have some discussion on the changing role of zoos, who in the 19th century and early 20th century, and in some parts of the world still today, are consumers of wildlife rather than conservers of wildlife. And then we have Will Travers, uh, who, for the, as long as I've known him, <laughs> has been leading the Born Free Foundation, he's now their president, uh, and is also the president of the Species Survival Network, SSN, which is a coalition of about 90 or 100, 100 uh, NGOs around the world who work on wildlife trade issues. So clearly there are, are a lot of organizations that see this as a really important event. Um, and you are fortunate enough to be in the room and driving the conversation. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite our four distinguished panelists. Let's say in the order which they are on the screen, because that uh, is there, uh, to say a few words for a few minutes, not long, um, just to warm things up a little bit and, and perhaps tell you what they <coughs> think is the most important aspect of this discussion. And then as quickly as possible, we'll get to a point where you can fire questions from the floor or I will read questions if any more of them come in. I have one here. Um, and we'll see where we go from there. So, the top of the list, uh, after the chairman's introduction, is Ben Garrett. So Ben, would you like to address the room? Thank you. Evening, everyone. Um, when Ian asked me to turn up, sorry, I'm just um, I've already started. <laughs> when Christoph asked me to turn up, um, no, when Ian asked me to turn up, keep kicking Christoph, sorry. Um, when I was asked to turn up, it so, was. So it's an edit edited recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they call me a 10 second wonder. Um, once I agreed to turn up, um, it was great because it's an opportunity to talk with other, like you say, distinguished people, not like in cosmos is distinguished, but like it's great. It's a really key topic that we need to address and should be addressed and isn't addressed as much as it could or should be. And it's one of these things that we all know it's going on. We all know it's bloody awful. And we all know the end point of the trade. But there are so few opportunities to actually do anything and actually make a difference, that's starting to change. And it's really important. I really believe we're on the cusp of something that's about to be a massive uh, avalanche of, of activity. And like uh, Ian said earlier, the, the big uh, get-together in, in February is a real clear sign that things are starting to change. Now, like Ian said, my background is in primatology. I worked for the Jane Goodall Institute in Uganda for several years, running a chimpanzee conservation program. I also worked in Southeast Asia, uh, running, helped running a uh, Sumatran orangutan conservation program. So I've seen it from that side. I used to work in Madagascar, um, uh, where Christoph's very uh, well accustomed to. And we saw local people who were exploited to trade in local wildlife. In Uganda, we had one guy from a place in Europe who came and harvested our local forest of every community he could find. It was a desperate, dire, dire situation. And then I've seen it from the other side now. So I'm trying to, trying to get this passion and this love of conservation, of the natural world, of wildlife that we all have out to a wider audience. Um, and I thought about a quote earlier. I went for Darwin, and I went for Goodall, and I, I couldn't find the appropriate one. So I went for that classic uh, chap, Spider-Man. 
and realize that the, the ultimate quote we could use in this situation is that with great power comes great responsibility. And I'm not meaning that in a crass way, but we all live in a situation where we're educated, where we have social media at our fingertips, where we have the possibility to go to Africa, to Asia, to any continent or country or, or situation we want to, do, to go. And with that comes a huge responsibility. So my thing recently within the TV media world has actually made me really think about how we do things and the, the consequences of what we say. We were very keen right from the start, never use personal collections, never go into the wild and say, oh look, here's a chimp skull. We were at institutes, we were at the Zoological Society of London, we filmed at uh, Bristol Zoo, we filmed in different museums, and we always specified this is a collection piece, this is ethically sourced wherever we could. There's such a fine line, because there are, like Ian said, people out there who will go and target certain things. I'm contacted all the time. I would love a gorilla skull. Well, that's great. Um, do you have a pet gorilla? No, there you go. I call hope again a gorilla skull. Um, but now I have your email address, that's great. I will happily pass you over. We, we get that, well, I get that, and colleagues get that on an infrequent but regular enough situation. The moment you start telling these people, say, you do know it's illegal, don't you? You do know that you're fueling the illegal trade. Often they'll come back and go, no, I, I really can think. And these aren't people who are cloak and dagger hiding down the alleyways trying to steal grannies and steal gorilla skulls. These are often educated people who are just not educated enough. I think that's what we really need to, to, to change. We've got to work from two perspectives. The one where, at the, the grassroots level, right down the base, where you make almost a stewardship for local people. Don't let them take your animals. Don't let them uh, hunt your wildlife. And then also we've got to work at the other side, the, the consumer side, whether that's collecting a skull or taking an ivory or, or eating shark fins, whatever. We've got to do it from that dual point of view. And I think it's starting to change, but there's a long way to go yet. So my area is as a primatologist and trying to give that message, that, as Jane always says, that reason of hope or that, that message of hope to a wider audience. Thank you. Hope. Uh, that's always a problem because every time when I think about wildlife trade and every time I, I, I collect more data, analyze more data, see more reports, etc., um, it's not hope that I get. There's nothing positive. It's always getting worse. Um, and perhaps one of the things that I uh, uh, like to bring to the debate is that when we think about wildlife trade, or certainly when the general public thinks about wildlife trade, uh, it's all about the miserable things. It's about, about, about elephants being slaughtered. It's about the ivory trade. It's about tigers being, being traded. It's perhaps, uh, 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 we saw some, some, some gorilla pictures earlier. Um, it's all about basically the, the, the icons of wildlife that are being traded. And that's what also where the funding is for. If, if you do, I do work on, 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 on the research on wildlife, or if I work with organizations, where the funding comes from is always to work on tigers or to work perhaps on bears, or to work on, on elephants. Um, but when I think of wildlife trade, I don't necessarily think of the tigers, or the elephants, or the gorillas, but it's the thousands of other animals that are being traded in absolutely humongous amounts and volumes um, that really make it even more sad than just looking at things like tigers or elephants. Um, and the key thing about wildlife trade, it's, 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 it's a commercial enterprise. Um, nobody gets rich, nobody gets any money out of it by selling one gorilla skull or one tiger skin. Um, you make money by selling thousands of uh, individual items. Um, you can't run a business by selling one chimpanzee. Uh, you run a business by selling just about every animal or any plant that is available to you, and you do it in quantities that actually make sense, so you, 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 you can buy your, uh, pay mortgage and things like that. Um, so for me, that's the key thing, is, 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 is go away from thinking that wildlife trade is selling uh, uh, something at the airport, one tiger skin, to thinking of, it's, it's a container load full of wildlife, or it's, uh, um, a million geckos a year out of one factory. That's sort of like the, the volumes we have to think of. Um, 
Perhaps that's my contribution for now. Thank you. Get the theme of it. Yeah, good, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here to um, put a bit of light on the role of zoos, or the role that zoos are playing in um, helping to find solutions uh, to the illegal wildlife trade. And um, I'm here to speak um, for Bristol Zoo, for Bristol Zoological Society. I'm certainly not speaking for all the zoos in the world. Um, and as Ian has already said in his introduction, there are many zoos in the world and there are zoos and zoos. So um, there are about, I would say, 1,200 maybe what we would call scientifically led zoos and zoological societies in the world that are usually organized in national or regional um, or even world zoo associations. Um, and there are probably about maybe 10,000, probably even more, um, institutions that would call themselves zoo, but that have not very much in common with these 1,200 or whatever it is zoos um, that I mentioned first. Um, those 1,200 zoos, um, give or take, um, have um, made a transition in the last, I would say, 50, 60 years. So in the 19th century, um, most zoos actually, as Ian rightly said, were consumers of wildlife. Um, many zoos were actually even founded by wildlife traders, and one famous example is Hagen Bay Seepark in Hamburg, that I'm very familiar with because I am German. So Karl Hagenbeck was a wildlife trader. He had a wildlife trade operation. He sold animals that he caught in faraway countries to zoos, actually. And then in um, 1907, I think it was, he founded his own zoo in Hamburg, and, and exhibited these animals and used the zoo as well to showcase the animals that he would sell to other zoos. So many zoos in the 19th centuries did regard um, animals as commodities and were actively trading in them. Since World War II, and maybe a bit more specific since the 1960s, 70s, um, in some parts of the world later than that, even zoos have made a very big transition from um, consumers to conservers of wildlife, um, and the zoos in the UK, um, which are grouped together in Bayaza, the British and Irish Zoo Association, have played a very active and very leading role in that. Um, nowadays, scientifically led zoos are actually helping to find solutions to the illegal wildlife trade. Um, two examples, maybe three examples that I want to mention that we are involved with at Bristol Zoo. Uh, Cameroon. Cameroon is uh, one of the countries where we see um, a lot of bushmeat illegally being exported into Europe, into countries such as the UK, France and other European countries. Um, and we have been working in Cameroon since um, uh, more than 10 years now. Um, we are supporting a sanctuary there, Ape Action Africa, that is home to orphaned gorillas and chimps, and these animals are orphaned uh, in many cases because of the illegal wildlife trade. They are confiscated by the national authorities in Cameroon and then brought to Ape Action Africa to the sanctuary at the outskirts of Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon, um, and are being kept there in captivity, well, I would say in semi-captivity because these are very large enclosures, actually fenced in pieces of forest where these animals are then piling up. And if, the, if these sanctuaries wouldn't exist, there wouldn't be any opportunity actually for national authorities in many of these um, primate habitat countries to go and confiscate these animals because where would they put them? So Bristol Zoo is actively supporting the sanctuary financially. We are also working in the Jar in Cameroon in a um, national park to um, actually help fight bushmeat um, trade directly um, to provide alternative livelihoods to local people living in the periphery of this national park um, so that they don't have to go in and hunt wildlife. We do similar things in Madagascar. Madagascar is a prime example where we haven't actually had such a big trade, such a big illegal trade, at least not in primates, up until about 2008 when suddenly levels surged to really unprecedented numbers 
because of a political crisis in the country. So in 2009, uh, the democratically elected president was overthrown and uh, actually ousted at gunpoint by an ex-DJ who then took over and uh, hold grip of the country um, until the 25th of January this year. So there were basically four and a half years of political crisis. And in these four and a half years, um, the numbers of animals going out of Madagascar have surged to very, very high levels. Um, primates uh, have not been that much affected by international trade, but rather by um, national trade, so people are catching them um, for consumption, but also to sell them to restaurants in Madagascar. And we haven't seen that in Lima's very much before that political crisis. And then another example, and this is actually where I want to just pick up on what um, Vincent said. Um, many of the large conservation organizations are actually looking at tigers and gorillas and things. We also do that, but zoos have a brilliant opportunity because we are also exhibiting things like reptiles and amphibians and invertebrates and so on. We are also looking into the issues with these species, and I've been to Vietnam to try and set up a project for a critically endangered turtle species. And these guys have no known occurrence in the wild anymore. So um, these things are so rare because of the illegal trade into China that um, people just don't know if there are any more left in the wild or not. We are breeding them at the zoo. There is a network of zoos actually breeding this species, the Anon leaf turtle, uh, with the potential of reintroducing them into very heavily guarded reserves in Vietnam if that becomes feasible. So these are just three examples, and I'll leave it here and hand over to Will. Who's the most underdressed person here this morning? Well, firstly, um, very interesting to hear those. I'm, I've written stuff. Um, I just got off a plane from the States, so if I fall asleep, it's your fault. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to quickly phrase this. I thought I would um, set my scene by talking about scale, scale of trade, the sheer volume of trade. And we've touched just now, all of the other panelists have touched on illegal trade, but actually we should be talking about legal trade. Because legal trade, it, the volume of legal trade is quite phenomenal. Um, it's worth about 400 billion US a year. 400 billion US a year. That includes tree and marine timber, but I prefer to say tree because tree is a tree and timber is a commodity. And uh, marine species. Uh, the illegal trade is worth about 20 billion uh, a year of that. Um, and when we're talking about numbers, we're talking about sharks being killed at the rate of between, say, 40 and 70 million individuals a year. Talking about hope, there is a little little bit of hope as far as sharks are concerned in that the uh, Chinese government has now made it um, government policy not just sh to serve shark skin products, shark skin soup, at official state functions. And you, you wouldn't think that that has a, a major impact in terms of volume, but it has a massive impact in terms of messaging. And uh, the recent data shows that the amount of shark skin being consumed has fallen by up to 80% following that decision. What, is, what does this trade also mean? It means that there's massive levels of animal suffering, sharks, just one example, um, but also loss of biodiversity. Um, I think I'm right in saying that 16% of all parrot species are affected, are negatively affected by trade. In other words, their existence is threatened by trade. It's not habitat loss, it's trade directly. Um, so, my background briefly on this. Uh, I work closely in the CITES arena, CITES Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, of wild fauna and flora. Um, I've been to every CITES conference of the parties since 1989. That's Lausanne, Kyoto, Fort Lauderdale, Harare, Nairobi, Santiago, Bangkok, The Hague, Qatar, Bangkok again, and coming up, Cape Town, where the South African government will put forward a proposal, almost certainly, to legalize, seeking international support for the legalization of Rana. Hopefully, we can perhaps discuss that shortly. Um, and so, what's the purpose of CITES? Very briefly, it is an international wildlife trade control convention. It is not a conservation treaty. 
and uh, there are 30,000 species listed on the appendices of CITES, about 1,000 in Appendix 1, which prohibits trade, and the rest broadly on Appendix 2, which is supposed to monitor and control trade. Uh, to give you one more example in terms of volume, the, tra the annual trade in python skins alone is about a billion dollars a year. CITES is 40 years old, and I'm going to throw a, a question to you, is, which is, CITES was there designed to try and make wildlife trade sustainable. Yes, it was designed to try and make sure that trade was not the component that drove a species to extinction. But CITES is 40 years old, and uh, not long before that, 1959, I looked this up earlier, 1959, the world had 3 billion people. We now have 7.2 billion people. So my question, which I put at a recent meeting uh, of experts on wildlife trade um, uh, in the EU, in Brussels on the 10th of April, um, can we continue with what Robert Mugabe uh, harangued the CITES meeting in Harare with in 1997, the use it or lose it paradigm. And I'll just refer briefly to this and then I'll sit down. Um, I said here, given the state of play with so many species at the moment, I think that the economic model based on it pays, it stays, is actually redundant. More and more uh, species are affected by trade. And when we say sustainability, because we always talk about sustainable trade, it's all about sustainable trade. Ecotourism, responsible travel, sustainable trade. We use sustainable like we use a Kleenex. It's something we casually use, and then we throw it away because it's become so easy, so comfortable, so facile. We don't truthfully know what sustainability is. We really don't. I mean, you get on the plane, and I just got off one. It's not sustainable. Straight away, it's not sustainable. We like to wrap it up in the cotton wool of sustainability because we like to feel comfortable, or a little more comfortable, about what we're doing. What I think we're doing when we talk about trade is that we're allowing ourselves to use terminology that permits us to continue to erode our wildlife capital, our natural capital, for a, for a period that is beyond our own time, so that we don't use it all up, so there's still something left. I think that true sustainability is a myth, and we should stop using it. As I said, there's 7.2 billion of us, and there's very few of them, and by them I mean those charismatic megavertebrates, but also everything else, quite honestly. You know, 400,000 African elephants, 20 to 25,000 rhino, max, 30,000 lions, max, 3,500 tigers, pangolins going down the tube, loris being used in trade in unsustainable ways. So I think we've got to stop employing the sustainability paradigm and come up with something else. And that's what I'd like to discuss. What is the something else? What new concept? can we deploy that will get us away from the idea that we just keep on using it, but in a more responsible way, but with the end game being that it will all be gone. I'm on that cheerful note. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm not wanting to... Um, brush aside the, the gravity of what Lewis has said. Because um, it isn't just that we're losing each component of our ecosystems and biodiversity, but we're losing the function that they play, the role they play. And that's what really worries me. Those, those of you who follow me on Twitter, at 4 uh, or on Facebook, might recall a few days ago I, I circulated a link to an article about whale poop. It was Americans and I have a P on the end. Whale poo, I suppose we would say. Uh, and I have frequently spoken about the positive power of poo. Because what he was observing in this article was that 
when the industrial whaling reduced the populations of the barley whales, people expected plankton to uh, krill, sorry, krill to, to boom because there weren't all these huge whales eating them. And what happened was krill populations died with the lack of whales. So they, there was some discussion as to why this might be, and iron seemed to be a possibility. So they looked at whale food and found that it was very rich in iron. And you think of all these blue whales and, and uh, humpback and all the other massive mammals and sea uh, mammals that are every day eating fish and pooing at the other end. That's an awful lot of fecal matter, which is the basis of the food chain on which the plankton and the krill feed. I make the same observation about elephants. Because elephants, yeah, we've got 400,000. Some people will say, that's not an endangered species. We've got 400,000 in the world. But a couple of lifetimes ago, there were probably 10 million. An adult elephant eats about 4% of his or her body weight a day. And most of that comes out the other end. So every week, an elephant roughly is producing about a tonne of poo, of manure. So you've got 10 million elephants. Every week, that's 10 million tons of manure, which rather raises the productivity of the forests and grasslands, that they, and then there's the rhinos and all the other large of different species which are doing this. And you take them out of the system, and productivity goes down. So those people who are saying, well, we have to cull the seals because they eat all the fish. They're not thinking, where does the fish go once it comes through the seal? It comes out, and it's the basis of the food chain. So by reducing these populations to a tiny fraction and then calling them endangered, we're kind of missing the point. They should be endangered when they're starting to decline, not when they're at the bottom of that decline. And what we're doing, and Christoph's example of the, the turtles in Southeast Asia, is that absolutely the last step on that. Whatever function they played in their ecosystem, they're ecologically extinct and have been for a long time. Whether they actually go extinct is another matter. But if you put them back, you have to then give them time, no idea how long it's going to be, to build up numbers to actually be able to play the role that they evolved to play, and which we all depend on. And it's that interlinkage between the biosphere that is out there, we call biodiversity, and what we're doing to it. So, yeah, Will's gravity is justified. And, and you are the generation that is going to carry this discussion forward. I think one of the big ideas that Will is looking for is payment for ecosystem services. Well, you don't pay for an animal, you pay to keep it doing what it does, or a plant. And payment for ecosystem services is something which if you're not familiar with, you can look it up and find lots of erudite papers about it, but not many practical examples. They're growing. There are practical examples where pests is saving habitats and perhaps species. And that's, that's exciting, because if people understood what they were doing when they bought that souvenir, whatever it is, that they were contributing towards the destruction of one of the important cogs in the machinery of life that we all depend on, they might think differently. So I think you're right, education is the key. So, over to you guys. What questions, and if you can address your question to a specific speaker, please do, uh, and we'll see how that goes. And if not, then I'll start to read out some of the ones which will be handed to me um, as we go. So any, any hands from the floor <coughs> wanting to jump on one of the short statements you've had as to be instructively critical or suggesting or yes? So this was mainly for Christoph. Do you think it's really possible to have a lot of mixed reviews of actually introducing species back into the world if they are extinct in the world? Because if they need so much space and so much time, is there actually things to say that species do manage to be balanced? Uh, I think yes, and it has been done actually. So um, there are examples where species have been reintroduced into places where they have become locally extinct. Um, for instance, one that I know well is the uh, black and white rough lima that was reintroduced into the uh, Analamazotra National Park in Madagascar where it became locally extinct in the 1980s only, so there were about 30 years in between where there were no black white rough lemurs, and that population is thriving, obviously, 
that is a national park with some level of protection. In Madagascar, as I just said earlier on, that doesn't often mean that much, unfortunately. Um, it's one of the better national parks, though, um, in that country, and that actually also gets a lot of tourists, so that um, people living in the periphery of that area actually know the value of keeping wildlife alive inside a protected area, and, and so they do. So many people have an income there from ecotourism, for instance. But this project has gone very well. There are other projects where species have been reintroduced into the wild successfully. Um, Bristol Zoo, as an example, is currently working um, on a conservation translocation program for the African penguin. Um, the species is not yet extinct in the wild, but it has um, decreased from about well, more than a million breeding pairs at the turn of the last century to about 21,000 in Southern Africa now. And so it's a very dramatic decline. It has just been uplisted from vulnerable to endangered and is currently going away to critically endangered if nothing happens. And the reason for that seems to be a lack of food near the breeding colonies of these penguins. The penguins are very conservative. They don't just go where the food is and open up a new colony, and that happens, but only every 100 or 150 years or so. Um, and the fish have moved away from the current nesting colonies because of global climate change, we think, but also due to overfishing around Cape Town and these busy fishing ports in that area. So we are currently trying to, uh, we're saying uh, if the mountain doesn't come to a profit, we're bringing the profit to the mountain. We're trying to establish new penguin colonies artificially in places closer to where the fish is so that they are more suitable for the long-term survival of the species and we think that will hopefully work. Which so is an interesting example. Uh, and I was going to ask you about the lemur one because this is a discussion about trade. So were the black and white roughed lemurs being captured or killed for meat or for traditional medicine purposes? And if so, how did you address in the reintroduction preventing that? Otherwise people have been hard up because they haven't had any to kill. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Bring them back. <clears throat> no, um, well, it's, it's a good question because this is very difficult to, uh, even though they only became locally seen in the 1980s, our data on the reasons for it are not really good because there wasn't that much research before the 1980s yeah. to actually say why they went extinct there in the first place. We think that Rough lemurs are one of the species of lemur that are um, the most highly frugivorous. So about 90% of their diet is fruits, and they depend on very large fruiting trees. And um, they live in large communities of up to 25, 30 individuals. So they need large fruiting trees to support such a large group. Um, and when people illegally harvest these trees for timber, then the first trees to go usually are the large ones um, and they obviously then take smaller ones with them in the wake of, of cutting them down, but usually the large ones are going first so that these species that are very, very dependent on those large trees are also the first to go from these ecosystems and we think that the rough lemurs may have suffered that fate. The National Park that is very small, there is an a larger park adjacent to it that still has rough lemurs and those animals were taken and translocated to the smaller park. So whether or not... It's the trade in timber which has a secondary effect yes. is yes, impacting exactly. on... So it is yeah. trade. Thank you. I just wanted to keep it well, clear. Yeah, it's, There's it's so many trade. conservation issues we yeah. could discuss, particularly with this panel. Yeah. Uh, so... No, that's, that's true. That's right. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in on, on that? No. Well, perhaps other than that, for every example you can find where successfully someone has reintroduced a species or a population or successfully has translocated a population, um, it can't be that difficult to find a thousand examples where a population goes extinct. So prevention is always uh, uh, at least a thousand times easier and cheaper and, and, and uh, uh, more effective than trying to fix it uh, <coughs> in the end. Particularly with the rate of deforestation that despite all the efforts to reduce it hasn't yet been reduced, and the fact that so many species are endemic in quite a small area, and many of them have not yet been described. So it's hard to find them because they haven't been described and studied and their decline documented because it's gone before that happens. So, uh, another 
question from me. Yes. You talk about the legal trading primates, and a lot of the airlines at the moment are refusing to um, fly primates for laboratory purposes. I mean, when you're looking at that implication on the pharmaceutical industry, isn't that going to be a hard one to fight? Because you look at major financial burden on pharmaceutical companies who have huge influences in countries like the United States when they're using primates because it's cheaper and easier. So they're going to cause a lot of problems. If in the reduction, if you are looking at reducing the trade of primates, as an example of a species? It's, I don't think the, um, a very little of the trade, as far as I'm aware, is wild caught trade. It's, it's mainly um, captive bred, purpose I mean, I'm not in favor, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but um, it's, it's captive bred um, from the Philippines, uh, as far as I'm aware. So, uh, it's a different issue. It's yeah. are we able to persuade airlines as carriers not to carry primates because we are a society moves perhaps, although the number of animal experiment using experiments is actually going up, but as society may be moving to a point where it's can find other models which then are satisfactory in terms of legal compliance and allows us to drive forward our agenda an agenda, a social agenda which is shouldn't be experimenting on primates, not on primates. And yet, the most <laughs> traded um, mammal is a long tailed macaque for biomedical research, largely. And although that is supposed to be captive bred, there's very good evidence it's yeah. supposed to be F2 generation, that is, two captive generations before you sell them. And there's very good evidence um, from uh, Indonesia in particular that the captive populations are augmented on a not very clear and carefully documented way by wild caught animals and the mode of capture is um, cruel and is not something that should be supported. Uh, so you're right that, that animal testing does create a market and some of it is still um, fed by wild caught animals or populations that still depend on wild caught animals to augment their genetic you know, uh, variety or um, or even if it's been done uh, illegally, shipped out as, as captive bred on wild caught documents. And, and as you saw some of the images cycling through before we started uh, speaking, um, there, as well as biomedical research, uh, entertainment is still a big draw and leads to this perception that if you can get hold of a particular primate or a tiger or something which can be filmed or be used as a photo prop, uh, you can make money. Because people will go, ooh, and ah, and sometimes ha ha ha. So you train your animal to do tricks, and you've got an audience of thousands of people each paying money to come and see the animal doing tricks. We did it in this country, I grew up where, where that was the norm. Boxing Day entertainment to watch the circus on the telly. And now we're, we're um, disapproving of that, and, Animal acts and circuses are certainly on the way out. Well, we'll be banned next year. We'll be banned next year. Uh, but in, in China, they're still buying things like that, and many of the circuses are actually attached to zoos. So if you haven't seen the reports, go to carlaman.com, two M's and two N's, because Carl has been investigating the illegal shipment of apes from Africa, about 120 chimpanzees, who are now wearing clothes, riding tricycles in circuses in China. We invited a member of the Chinese um, diplomatic community in London to come and speak here, because Will and I and, and a few other people went to see them before the London meeting on illegal wildlife trade to try and open communications with them. And the ambassador said he was most concerned that the Chinese were always getting this negative press. And so I thought inviting someone to come and speak, and, and, and they are a change that the wildlife laws will say it's now illegal to eat endangered species in China. They've taken shops off official banquet menus, which is great. Um, and they're, they're really coming down ivory traffickers, which is fantastic. But the government policy is still to have a legal ivory trail. And we're trying to persuade them that that isn't tenable, but they've got a tradition going back thousands of years of producing the most amazing works of art in ivory, and they don't want to lose that. It's a difficult one. Sorry, I'm 
trying not to monopolise the conversation. Uh, more questions from the floor. Yes. Uh, one possible solution that's been proposed to um, illegal wildlife trade to legalise certain products, say rhino horn or something, farming of rhino. What, what do you think about that? Is that a workable solution? <laughs> well, <laughs> on a flight. <laughs> um, well, no, does anyone in the flight talk about rhino country? If you well, start, I'll... Okay. I'll <laughs> um, I've just been in Pretoria, you can see another unsustainable flight, um, at a meeting uh, of um, about 120, 140 people talking about this whole notion of legalizing rhino country. And just from my perspective, I think it's insane. Absolutely stark raving mad. Because there's about uh, 16 tons of rhino horn in the South African stockpile, okay? So 16,000 kg. And the average dose weight is about a gram. And so you've got about 16 million doses to try and satisfy the demand in a market you don't know, a market you can't control, and a market you don't understand. And they're going to try and do that, this is the South African proposal, through the creation of what's called a CSO, a Central Selling Organization. And they're going to use pseudo-economics. It's not even economics. It's false economics to try and control demand. It's the simple, if there's too much demand, we hike the price, we dampen demand. If there's not enough, we drop the price, we increase demand. The poaching community doesn't give a toss. What you set the price at? Set it at 60,000 a kilo which is where it is now, or 50, or 40. Poaching community just comes in at 30 and says, you can buy from the legal source, but buy it from me. And by the way, I have a string of relatively impoverished Mozambicans lining up to cross the border into the Kruger, and if a few of them get killed in the process, or even a few hundred get killed in the process, I really don't care. That's, that's the value of the rhino horn trade, and South Africa is not just tiptoeing, but is marching into an absolute nightmare scenario, which will not reduce rhino poaching in my view, it will increase rhino poaching. So we are trying to persuade the minister, Edna, Edna Malema, to um, abandon the policy before she makes a fool of herself at CITES in 2016. Have a say. Uh, and then welcome to my world, because um, I work in Asia, um, and I work in, uh, 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 in border areas with China. And even though I'm very, very much concerned about African rhinos, mm. I'm even more concerned about the Asian ones. And if we think that the African rhinos are, are, are going down, and they are going down, but we still have about 40,000 of them running around. If you think of Asian rhinos, uh, um, we have populations of probably about, about well, what is it? Uh, 5,000 Indian ones, 500 Sumatran ones, 50 uh, Javan ones. Um, all with slightly smaller horns than the ones in Africa. Um, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that if we have such small populations and the market is going to be opened up, um, even if that's going to drop down the price to, let's say, 20,000 pounds a kilo, 10,000, it doesn't really matter. Once you're in the forest in Asia and you're there to do other stuff anyway, and you see a rhino, or it takes you a couple of weeks to find a rhino, all it costs you is sent you one bullet to kill it. Uh, and that's it. So that's, that's why econo economy doesn't work. It's, 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 um, um, if it opens up, the first ones to go extinct are the Asian miners, uh, uh, and the African ones will follow or get a massive dent in the population. Mm -hmm. uh, so I find it very, very frightening. And just as an example, um, I worked in Borneo uh, for quite, quite some time, and I met the old traditional, no, not traditional, the old rhino hunters. Um, and these are hunter-gatherers that uh, um, can kill just about everything. Uh, they're amazing to work with. And we spoke to them, and I, I first went there in the early 90s, and I said, well, why don't you hunt rhinos in this area? And they said, because there were rumors that there were still some, some, some smart rhinos around. And they said, well, we would, but we think it will take more than six months to find one. And that's not worth the effort. <coughs> The moment it goes down to less than six months, of course we will do it. Um, so all you need is a couple of footprints in the forest, mm. and you get a couple of these put on guys, um, and they track them down. And they have all the patience there is. Um, 
And if, if, if they think they can track it down within less than three, four, five months, they will do it. Um, so you don't stand a chance of preserving any of them. Um, um, and uh, you may also know last year, at around uh, well, March was the first announcement, uh, uh, October the 2nd, um, a very well known uh, conservation organization made it widely known that uh, Sumatran rhinos were found again in, in Kalimantan. Uh, um, posted nice photographs and, and, and videos online. Um, and within months, we, we know that professional parties already uh, uh, made a move <coughs> to, to Kalimantan uh, uh, and they're, they're going after them now. Mm. Um, and you can't really protect a rhino in the rainforest. Um, and, um, so, uh, uh, so yes, uh, I'm very concerned about the African rhinos, uh, but the Asians ones are the ones to go first. Um, and, uh, and maybe just to add to that, I deem it impossible to commercially farm rhinos. We have, it's, it's tremendously difficult to breed a rhino in fertility. Um, zoos have tried breeding Sumatran rhinos since decades, and it's just so difficult. We don't understand their reproductive uh, ecology at all. We are okay now with breeding black rhinos in a small population in European and North American zoos, but all the other rhino species, well, Indians may work, but, but white rhinos, an African rhino species that has been kept in, in zoos um, for a hundred years at least, and we still don't really breed them well. Northern <coughs> rhinos not at all, and German rhinos haven't, haven't been a fertility. Uh, but it's really difficult, and I would say farming them is impossible with today's knowledge. But they are. There, there, is, a, there is a research facility on Hainan Island where they've imported large amounts of, of, of white rhinos over the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, and and it's, 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 we may not like it, but they're doing it. In China? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Over, over 200. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah it's, there's, there's two quick mm -hmm. statistics just to add to this to give you more numbers. In 2007, South Africa lost 13 rhino poached, and last year it was 1,004. So there's a, an exponential growth in poaching. You're quite right. The most vulnerable populations, wherever they are, will be the ones that go first. And if you think about it, Kenya has a GDP of $20 billion a year. South Africa has a GDP of $400 billion a year. If any country in Africa is in a position to protect its wildlife resources, it's South Africa. And they have completely lost the plot on this. On the rhino farming, there's a guy in South Africa who has 1,000 rhinos. He personally owns a thousand rhinos. His name's John Hume. He is pushing for this trade thing like you wouldn't believe it because he knows he can harvest a kilo a year from his live herd. And you can do the maths, but if you've got a thousand rhino, fifty thousand dollars a kilo, and you take a thousand kilos a year, it's a lot of money. That's what he's in. Of course, that's not fun before so you got commercially farmed rhino, something that doesn't take a big leap for some guy to go, mine's wild, free range rhino. And, and that's not already been known as a premium product. Same with tiger crap, so it happens, doesn't farm, it? Farm tiger and rhino, they have to have the same value. Yeah. So, um, so can I, very, very briefly, if you all think that rhino horn is used as sort of like a, 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 a to increase uh, your, 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 your potency, whatever, uh, um, it's not. The number one reason why people use rhino horn is to get rid of headaches. Um, in, in, in Vietnam nowadays, it's for the, uh, the upper class, um, it's, it's used as a hangover cure. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it's not even that, that that's, uh, uh, it's, it's for something important. It literally is, is aspirin works much better. Mm -hmm. If you're clever and you have a hangover, and you're very rich and you're a Vietnamese, uh, um, and you want to be sort of like part of the, uh, the, the hip and, and whatever, uh, um, then you take your, 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 your rhino shavings, uh, but you also put an aspirin in there, mm -hmm. because it's not going to work. Um, if you want to get rid of your, your, your headache, you have to do both. Uh, but that's based on what we're up against. It's, it's sick. Um, a lot. So demand reduction is talked about a lot. And it was part of the um, 25 point London Declaration on the Indian Wildlife Trade that came out of the meeting in London in February. And I know that the British government, who we also invited to send someone here to tell you about that, and they couldn't feel anyone tonight, um, but they tell me that they are helping Botswana, that has taken a big step away from the usual Southern African use it or lose it philosophy um, to ban hunting and um, potentially destroy their ivory stocks. But um, they're going to host 
next year's forum meeting. So it started in London, but it's going to be continued in Botswana. And that's encouraging, because Botswana is an influential country in Southern Africa. And if we can swing them, perhaps we can influence their neighbors. But demand reduction is one of the issues. Well, was anyone going to ask a question about that? So that I just put the questions in to keep them. If you, if you want to see a really great web, uh, website about uh, demand reduction and, and public awareness in China, go to the um, Huawei's website and look at their, their PSAs, their public service announcements for Jackie Chan and Harrison Ford and 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 and, and. I mean, it's just a glittering list. Yes. Okay, so... so um, um, if back to the rhino thing, I've been to a few of um, Will Fold's talks on rhino conservation and I asked him the same question which he, he didn't agree with it but I've heard a lot about the idea of governments dehorning their own rhinos to try and prevent poaching. What, what do you think on that? Do you think that's something that could be done and, and if so would it work do you think? It was done okay. in Zimbabwe yeah. uh, in the mid 90s. Um, they moved all the rhino into what they called IPZs, Intensive protect Protection Zones. And Mike Cobb, um, who was the brother of Richard, who was the vet at London Zoo, was the lead uh, veterinarian in removing horn. And they go in, dart the rhino with a chainsaw, take it off, but take it off as close but without obviously causing um, structural damage. And um, poachers went in and removed the ear. They would shoot the rhino and remove the ear and send the ear to the Chinese commissioner, buyer, to prove that a rhino had died. Because it goes to the point that's been made. If you, if the fewer there are, the higher the price, the higher the value. If he's got 50 kilos in a stockpile, and he knows that the rhino numbers are being um, reduced, his stockpile's going to be more valuable. So I am very, very, also, rhinos need that horn. They actually do. Uh, particularly black rhino, they use it for defense against elephants, believe it or not, and they also use it for um, male dominant sparring and the rest of it. So, and, sorry, last point, if you take it off here, okay, above the, the nasal uh, cavity, um, you still leave a kilo of horn that dips below the line, and they'll kill for that, and then you've seen Wilfold stuff, you've seen, he came to our office and we talked to all our staff, and I have 30 people in tears, including him, and he's seen it 50 times, as he's reaching into the face of a rhino to try and do reconstructive surgery. And this is a live rhino that he's got his hands down the sinuses of this rhino to try and clean it out. It's pretty horrendous stuff. But if you a Google will follow as well, um, that's pretty extraordinary work. But there's also a point of view that because it is based on a myth that it has a medicinal effect, um, it's, it's unethical to promote a trade in something that you know yeah. would be better promoting aspirin or yeah. paracetamol or some other yeah. cheap and readily available drug. Yeah. So then it becomes a status symbol. And if it's a status symbol, as it used to be in North Yemen, you have a right or wrong dagger handle. Thankfully, that market has declined. Um, you just need to change that culture, make it uncool. At the moment, in, as, as Vincent says, in Vietnam, it's, it's, it's cool to be one of the rich, jet-setting people who have Rhino Hall as a hangover cure or whatever else they do with it. So, um, in the middle. Yeah. Um, well, it's a question for you. Um, in your hours mm -hmm. and days spent in CITES conference halls, um, I just wondered what your assessment of how CITES has worked over the last 30 years or so. And also, do you think in the future it has any ability to affect and improve matters? Uh, well, I, I can answer that really quickly, and then maybe others, because it's a very interesting debate about CITES. So it's 40 years old, and I use this argument. I say, okay, say it didn't exist, and then some bright spark. What's your name? Yeah. Yeah. Some bright spark will appear in and say, listen, wildlife's in trouble. We need to have a global convention that allows us, as an international community, to manage trade and even prohibit trade and even put sanctions, trade sanctions on countries if they break the rules. Do you think that's a good idea? If you tried doing that now, you'd be laughed out of court. It wouldn't exist. What we've got is the most useful tool in the box. It's just that we're not using it terribly well. 
So I would, I would absolutely not jettison CITES for, you know, for all the tea in China, literally. But I think it has to be much better applied. It has to be much more fearless in its approach. For, for the last 20 of the 25 years I've worked on CITES, nobody wanted to touch the really big commercial tree species, big leaf mahogany. You, uh, someone would talk about it down at the front, and you see the Brazilian trade representative running between tables, telling them all how to vote. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to touch the big commercial fish species. You don't want to touch things that affect countries such as Japan's, you know, continuing desire. And believe me, it's still continuing to to reintroduce whaling issues in a different form. But um, so I would stick with CITES. I would make it work a lot better. I would be more fearless with it. And I think the new Secretary General, John Scanlon, actually, to his credit, is highly ambitious and has a, a global vision for this um, convention and wants to get more money for it. You know, realize that CITES, you all think that CITES is this big thing. CITES is 20 people in Geneva with a budget of 5 million US a year. That's the secretariat. So that's what runs the whole site. Every country has their designated offices, but in terms of managing sites on a global scale, it's 20 people in Geneva with 5 million dollars. You know, I don't know, the university department. It's, it's ridiculous. But, uh, another guest we invited this evening who couldn't come is, is John Seller, who's just published a book called The UN's Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. Nice title. Uh, because a journalist on hearing that he was the one enforcement officer in the site secretariat says, so you're the Lone Ranger. Um, so he used that as the title of his book. And it's a very interesting insight into <coughs> what one person can do, which isn't that much, but, but you know, to work with the bodies who, are, um, who have the, the authority to enforce the domestic legislation which a government must pass once they've signed the convention. So it's a UN convention. It doesn't have any power. There isn't a UN government, and if there was, the US wouldn't want to do it anyway. Um, so, so it's it's an agreement between almost all the countries on the planet. What is it? 172? 180. 180 now. Keeps going up. Can't go much further because there's only about 190 something countries in the world. Uh, so it's almost every country is a party to CITES, but the enforcement of CITES is down to police force and customs officers in each country. So yes, there's only 20 people in, in Geneva, but CITES as a network includes almost every country and their law enforcement agencies, which are good, bad, and indifferent. Some are corrupt, some are diligent. And one, one of the things that CITES does is to, is to recognize, thanks to an awards system, scheme set up by SSA, those officers who have excelled in their duties. So the top revenue awards for uh, law enforcement are presented at each CITES conference, and sometimes they're posthumous as well, because people die enforcing the law to protect wildlife. And given that, you wonder why are we still trying to promote a sustainable wildlife trade if it causes the death of not only animals, but, but people on the good side and the bad side. Poachers have got kids and wives too, and they get killed because someone somewhere says, we'll give you this, watch your money, you'll go out and do that. Okay, I haven't got any money, I'll do it. It really is a, a very bloody trade. Can I make one little comment? Because uh, uh, you may have seen that I'm actually a, a part of CITES, as in I'm in the CITES scientific authority of the Netherlands that's holding, so Europe is one big block. Um, so I would actually very much agree. I think that of all the environmental uh, treaties we have, Rio, Kyoto, whatever, Bonn Con Convention, doesn't really matter, all of them, the one that is actually most successful is the one that's not a conservation convention with the CITES. Um, and again, if CITES were to be dreamt up now, it would never have been signed. And if you look at how CITES is framed and how it's worded, and what are the options available for countries to implement CITES, and you compare that to, let's say, modern treaties like Kyoto or the Rio Convention, um, it's, it's, it's a completely different kettle of fish. It, it's from a different, different time frame. So I, I would never, ever get rid of CITES. Um, it needs to be implemented much, much better. Um, and working on, let's say, on the site to site, where I see all the imports going into Europe and having to make judgments whether or not it, 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 it is sustainable or feasible, etc. It's very frustrating that nine out of ten times I actually don't have the information to make the, uh, to make, make the, the judgment. 
uh, but at least we are allowed to make a judgment and we have a look at it. it, it, it it's very, very different from, let's say, uh, 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 climate conventions or, or biodiversity conventions, etc. So uh, um, don't throw away societies. Yes. I, I mean, I've just got one little thing which I can give you a clear demonstration of how you can make it work better. And that is that live trade, so live trade in almost anything, um, builds into the business model uh, the injury and death of a certain percentage of the animals that are being caught. Bird trade was a great, great example. You know, you would build into the business model that you would only get 40% survival to, to market. So that's hugely wasteful. And CITES has language written into the convention which says that an animal shall be uh, prepared and shipped in such a way as to minimize the likelihood of injury, uh, suffering, or cruel treatment. But the implementation of that language only occurs as you load the animal onto the plane, the boat. In my view, the moment you interfere with that animal, the moment you put bird line out, the moment you throw a net over it, the moment you do anything to bring it into the trade chain, that is the point at which you should apply that language. And if you did that, you would have a massive impact, both in terms of biodiversity, on sustainability, all these issues, but it's not being implemented at the right point in the chain. And, and wildlife trade, unlike drugs trade, you have to look at the harm paradigm. You have to say, where does the harm happen? In the drugs trade, the harm happens when you take the drug. Okay? Not you. <laughs> I just don't see you on the door. No. But the harm happens. It's basically. No, it is. You take the drug. You, know, you are putting yourself at risk of harm. With wildlife trade, it happens at the front end of the trade, when you kill the animal, when you capture the animal. So your interdictions that happen afterwards, your enforcement interdictions that happen afterwards, they haven't prevented that suffering and that harm. Interdictions in the drugs trade, you, kept, you intercept the drugs as they're leaving, like Kenya just did. You saw this absolutely massive 230, 40 billion shilling uh, seizure of, of heroin. Just three days ago. Um, if you capture that, if you intercept that, it's basically prevented that heron from reaching me. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean. Surely that level of enforcement that to get the person, the hunter on the ground, the local person to subscribe to that is impossible. They don't care, do they? Well, how much? Then you have to come up with alternatives. Yeah. Most people in this room, and there's very us Okay, not us, these guys, what are some big hitters here. Most of you guys who want to go into conservation or anything like this, you won't be the level of will. It's just unfortunate, you just won't. You'll be on the ground. But in my mind, that's as important, if not more important, because that's where you, as you just said there, you actually create a stewardship, you create the ambassador. You, you, said, you suddenly go, it's your forest. I'm not here as a white guy saying, I want to protect your forest. I want, I want you to want to protect your forest. We had this thing in Uganda where our area, they were hunting every, we were just the Congolese border with the uh, Ugandan area where they were real commercial hunters. Stuff would go into international trade, stuff would go into local trade. We had every buying thing you want in our area. It was absolutely god awful. And we sat down for bloody ages discussing how to do it. And you know, Debbie Fox, I know mean, it's been Debbie, Debbie, she's an absolute war horse, but lovely. Um, <laughs> um, we finally come with a really gently, gently approach. And for so long we had this whole uh, carrot of stick. And we, in conservation, always gone, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But it's, there's no incentive. Why? If my kids are poor and I haven't got the money, but someone, some guy over there is offering me $500. We're not talking thousands and thousands. $500 to bring me and my mates to go kill a, a, a monkey or whatever, or a chimp. I don't care. It's worth one of us three or four dying. It is, because he's talking massive amounts of money. We did little things. I brought this today because I think this is so important. And I knew we'd talk about the big yeah. stuff. We had a huge problem with snails, massive problem. Every little village block around our forest area has these god awful bastard things. These are the bane of my life. They're brake cables and bikes. They're every piece of metal you can possibly imagine they'll be used. Now, but if you, those who go, you'll tie a sapling over, stick it to the ground, put a peg in, something will pop towards past, around its ankle, leg. And it's used for bush buck, dying up to elephants. In Queen Elizabeth National Park, we were taking 
half a tonne every six months. Uh, and this goes around, chimps feet, gorillas, legs, as it is, even knows. How the hell do you get them to stop doing that? So we went to the local villages. We came up with an idea, well, uh, between Debbie, myself, and an amazing uh, Aussie guy who came over, who's an artist, who's very floaty, bless him, and had huge, changed the world, and he did. Um, brilliant. Um, we went out to a local uh, community and said, right, who snares around right here? No, 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 no. No, 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 you snare. No, 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 no. That's a real, that's a real shame because we've brought some tools and we've brought this uh, Ugandan uh, artist who's taught you, who would have taught you a way to make, uh, we're talking $50 a month per person if you just had some metal. It was like you were magnetised. There was metal from every conceivable direction thrown at us. We nearly died down a snare thrown at us. And we taught them over the next couple of months to make tight. It seems so futile almost, but we made little snare cards. We taught them how to make paper. This is all pulp paper from banana shavings and, and stuff that they usually throw away for compost. We taught them how to make a tiny little outline. And then we'd already spoken to international buyers. We went to Chester Zoo, we went to Taronga Zoo, we went to uh, uh, placing it up in Canada. And we started exporting these. We sold them in, in Western uh, zoos for about five, five quid or five bucks a time. But the local people made two dollars a time. And what we first, and first of all, it was men, men don't make crafts. I'm ridiculous, all stuff. We went back two or three weeks later. There was a production line going. They, they, I think mean, they slept. It was great. We suddenly got, crap, we've got hundreds of these things to play now. Um, we have to. Um, suddenly you've got kids who are stripping the paper down. You've got adults who are, groups of men who are shaping it, women who are stitching it on. You have this amazing production line because you empower the people. Then we also went around and said, right, this is the, the really clever bit, which was Debbie's real big influence. Um, we suddenly thought there's nothing to actually stop them still hunting. So we will keep buying these as long as we don't see any hunting in your area. So what we'll do, we'll periodically come around, we'll look through the forest and we'll see if we see any snares, any, any bits of things we shouldn't see, any deforestation we shouldn't see, any downs we shouldn't see. Um, we'll, we'll just stop buying them. We're not going to bring the police, we'll just stop buying your snares. And then they went up, the, the, the savvy one said, yeah, but this village next to us, they're going to come to our patch. Well, that's your problem to sort out then. <laughs> we, we don't want we don't want turtles, but suddenly you, you let them know that if you see we're also paying them the same. So you don't go into their area in the forest. They don't come into your area, and it worked. And it worked so well because we'd empower them. We'd give them an alternative. It's not here's scientists, here's the police, here we're going to arrest this many people because next week you'll do it. If you give them an alternative, you give them some sort of grassroots. Empowerment, that's the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Really good story. And, and so, yeah, round of applause. And in a few minutes, we're going to have the raffle because we have to be out of here by 8 o'clock, I'm told. But it will suit us with giant watch. It's great because that copy's long. Um, I see that uh, we have got much longer. But I'm going to put this copy of the CBD, the Convention of Bible, versus Technical Series number 60. Livelihood alternatives for the unsustainable use of push meat into the raffle box. So if you're really interested, that could be yours. And if you don't get it and you're really interested, we've got some more to present. Oh. So, <laughs> because, or if there's a library here that you can put it into, because these documents are produced by UN agencies and then a lot of time and effort work goes into it, and, and most of them they tend to sit on people's shelves. They have ideas. Put them in this I don't know if that idea is in there. I wish it was. It's a great idea. So, I have some. Um, yeah, I just kind of want to follow on without asking an important question. What can you all suggest to students and everyone who's here to kind of help out and help this situation? Because obviously we can't read societies and stuff. Like, should we go on Twitter? Should we research it and tell everyone that we know about it should you become a researcher like what kind of advice can you give us because it's like almost laymen we're like there's lots of us that don't money high enough people you don't want to be that person you no. don't. But some of you might be. Some of you might be future directors of, of CITES or, or, or JDI or Born Free or whatever. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not Born Free. <laughs> you, 
it might be, I don't know, but the, most of you will get the grassroots stuff done. And that's, yes, get on Twitter, be a researcher, or be an artist with a great idea, or be someone who wants to work with local people to grow crops better and offer microfinancing, or become at ZSL or on base down in London. There's lots of economic students doing economy, or the economics of conservation. You can, it is, all you need is passion. You need passion and determination, and the ability not to get pissed off or damaged. Conservation is not fun. It's not easy. You do it because you're passionate. You don't do it because you think you're going to win. You do it because you hope you're going to win. And that's it. I think mm, well, there's a tweet that's waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You get that to 40 characters. <laughs> how, how many of our panelists do tweet? I know Will does. Well, ben does. Chris does occasionally. And, and although Vincent doesn't, his wife, Dr. Anna McClaris, does. Yeah. As, as little fire. Uh, yeah. I follow that. Yes. <laughs> um, You're not the only one, Will. <laughs> so, um, thank you. you no, can, can, I, can I make one comment? I think, I think actually, if what I think is very important is that we have a whole evening here where we all talk about wildlife trade as a, as a, as a, as a standalone issue. And I think it's very, very important that if you're interested in conservation, that you realize that wildlife trade is important. If you look at sort of like textbooks, and you look at the, the amount of, of, of space that's devoted to wildlife trade, or if you look inside the journals, the amount of articles that are devoted to, 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 to wildlife trade, or if you go to conferences on conservation, the amount of, of, of presentations and posters that are devoted to wildlife trade, it's very, very small. Um, and it's partially small because it's actually not a fun thing to work on. The more you get into it, uh, uh, you really need a hobby because it, it, it's sickening and it, it's not very, very pleasant. Um, it's much nicer just to, to, to observe a chimpanzee uh, uh, in, in the forest and see nice things. Um, but I think it's very, very important that people are aware that it happens. And the, I think it's also important that it's not something that actually is going to cost people money to do it properly. Um, I'm not against wildlife trade at all. Um, I think it needs to be done properly in a, in a properly regulated way. And in that sense, actually, wildlife trade is very, very different from, let's say, exploitation of oil, because we know that if you take out a thousand liters of oil out of, the, out, of the, out of the earth, we have a thousand liters of oil less. If you harvest a tree and you do it properly, you don't end up with less trees. You you, you plant a few new ones. So it's, it's, it's in principle, it could go on forever if you do it properly. We don't have to lose our money, all you have to do is to do it properly. Follow the rules, follow the regulations, etc, etc. Uh, um, so, pay your taxes, uh, and, 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 and then it, it should be, even though I'm not supposed to use the word, um, it can be a sustainable <laughs> industry. Uh, um, and, 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 and so, 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 the fact that you're here, the fact that people think about it and talk about it, uh, tweet about it, Facebook about it, whatever. Uh, that's already a good thing. Yeah, there, are things, there are things you can do locally here. So, for instance, um, uh, one of the biggest problems in Madagascar over the past couple of years has been the illegal trade in trees, Eberly and Rosewood. And um, the east of Madagascar is literally depleted now of Eberly and Rosewood trees. There's nothing left in several national parks. Um, but you can buy FSC certified wood products here, and this is in fact is running a behavior change campaign this year, we've done that last year as well, to convince our guests, our zoo visitors, to buy FSC certified um, wood products instead of products made out of um, wood that may have been maybe legally, maybe illegally harvested in countries such as Madagascar and others, um, that actually is very unsustainable. So you can do that yourself, you can promote that to your family and friends, you can come to the zoo and help us running the campaign. Um, there are lots of things that, that can be done, I think, uh, even in countries such as the UK, Germany and others in Europe. And, and I would add to that, I don't know how many of you came to the Shopping for the Planet debate we had last year, and what one or two people did. Um, but I would say that, that we are all powerful individuals. And we're powerful because we spend money. You all spend money, every day you spend money, and you can influence the people who sell you stuff by either not buying it, or by buying it and saying, I'm not gonna buy it again, so I've just seen on the label that you're using palm oil or some other 
um, a substance which has been harvested unsustainably, all free, is just joining the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council, in order to help them shape their policy to take into account other things, as well as the, the um, sustainable harvest of timber and the, race rela the, the, the <coughs> labor relations between the employers, uh, so that they, they actually have a humane approach to the wildlife on the forestry concessions. So, uh, individual actions as a shopper. Uh, you were saying you wouldn't get, get to CITES, but you have elected representatives whose job is to influence our government um, representatives at CITES. Every one of you is represented. And if you complain about your politicians that they don't represent your views, ask yourself, well, when was the last time you told them what you thought? Because they care. If, you, if they get 10 letters on the subject, they know that there's thousands of people out there who didn't get around to it. Be one of the 10, or the two, or mm. the three, who write. And it's very easy these days. You go to they work for you dot org or um, write to them on, online, and it will tell you. You put in your postcode, it tells you who your MPs are, who your MEPs are, who your local councillors are, and be one of the active ones so that your voice <coughs> is represented by those who are paid to represent you. And the third thing, of course, as Christoph says, you can get involved with organisations, whether it's Born Free or, or Bristol Zoo or other organisations. There are many out there, and non-governmental organisations have a role to play and have influence, and you as individuals can help shape that. And I would also say, actually, the fourth thing is, wherever you work, companies, corporations, some corporations are more powerful than many governments. And if you're in them, especially if you're not a conservation worker in the, in the environment section. If you're the typist, if you're pushing that company's policy in the right direction, you can influence it. There's four things that you can do. And you've been really patient with your arm. Even, I, I, I want to ask one of these, and we're running out of time, I've got poor Rafa, but quick, quick question. Yeah, in relation to the last question, how much um, demand do you think actually comes from the countries that are supplying? Because I went to Thailand last year, as I'm sure a lot of students like to travel, and I was amazed at how much demand actually comes from tourism and probably out the tourists, a huge percentage of which I'd say are students, and a number of them which claim to be animal lovers, yet are visiting tiger temples, swimming with dolphins, riding elephants, all of which contribute to the illegal wildlife trade. How much do you think actually comes from countries which are supplying, and how much do you think comes from what are considered to be more educated westernised societies where ignorance is just blitz? Um. Because I think um, a lot of it is actually coming from people who, like you said, are educated and are aware of the wildlife trade. And a lot of it doesn't necessarily seem to be from their own country where it's cultural backgrounds. I mean, I know it is with cases of rhino horn, but so much wildlife trade seems to come from tourism, particularly, I, I think, for people of my sort of age generation who want to travel and want to see different animals, but this is how they come yeah. into it. This is Thailand, and you can pay money and have your picture taken with your own yeah. you, you may not like the answer, but, but, but wildlife trade, if you, if everywhere I work in Asia, I would say, depending on which group you look at, uh, um, at least 95% of it is domestic, if not 99. Um, so wildlife trade, a lot of it is, 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 so CITES for instance, although it's a very important convention, uh, uh, the I in CITES is international, so it only deals with trade when it crosses the border. Um, I'd say that at least 95% of, of, of all trade is, is within countries. Um, so uh, um, that makes it a bit more difficult to... In many of the places where I go in the markets, uh, um, trade is not happening because there's, there's a, a foreign tourist showing up and buying something. It, 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 it's, it's local trade. Okay. But, but interestingly, APTA, Association of British Travel Agents, has just um, uh, approved, just, has just created, with help from probably representatives here, certainly us, the, uh, a new set of, the first set of uh, travel industry guidelines as they relate to the travel industry's interface with animals. So it could be domestic animals, but it could be wildlife souvenirs, it could be all sorts of, it could be public display facilities, what just about gets through and what absolutely doesn't. So it's going to create a whole raft of much more informed consumers who get uh, go away to Thailand or whatever and go, well, I'm not going there, and I'm not going there. And by the way, the company doesn't even sell a package to that place because it, it is so below the radar. Yeah. So this is this is all about that that huge need for public education, which we touched on yes. early on. Um, uh, which which television is a prime medium, but so is um, so is the internet. 
Um, I'm not sure what to do. I have four places I've been trying to slip in. You're desperate to ask a question, I'm and we've got to pull a raffle. Yes. What do you suggest we do with the stockpiles then, and can we go back to the selling trade? Just one. Burn. If, if the stockpiles so are contraband, they if they're confiscated stockpiles, yeah. they should be destroyed. Anyway. The UK doesn't have a stockpile because when the court case is over and it's no longer needed as evidence, it's destroyed. Not as a special fanfare, it just happens. Uh, or it's given to a school as education, but that can have a problem if, if it's valuable like Ryan wants because someone will break in and nick it. Um, so yes, I, I think destroying them sends a, a very strong message uh, that this won't be a trade. And those people who say, oh, you should sell it and use the money for conservation, it's like fighting a fire by throwing petrol on it. Stimulating demand, um, not lowering the price sufficiently that it would make it um, not attractive to a poacher, and therefore it ain't gonna help. Um, so I wanted to know. say that Rachel Topley asked about um, the trade in apes, live apes, and what, how does that relate to the other threats? And I would very quickly say it's just one more we're creating the perfect storm. Whether you capture them alive, you kill them and sell them meat, or you just destroy their homes. It's hard to say which is the more important. It depends where you are, and, and uh, so it varies a lot. But, but it's a combined effort. Uh, Simon Garrett asks, uh, which branches of the evolutionary tree are OK to trade, alive or dead, and which are not? Um, I think, I don't know if, uh, Will has already said, you know, no trade should be the, the solution. And uh, I think in, a, in a, a global economy that is based on growth, if we had an economy that, that the aim was to have a level line, then maybe there would be. But if growth is your target, and you have an almost infinite market of 7.2 billion people and rising who might want to buy it, and you've got a natural population, no way any natural population is going to keep up with the demand. Where do you draw the line? I mean, seahorses are under huge pressure for, from consumption in the Far East. Absolutely massive pressure. And they brought in regulations to control that. And then they had to bring in new regulations to say, well, you can only have seven. And why has poison right now, Horn, um, still ended up confiscated? Um, is the poison of the Horn not obvious? Um, I don't think it is obvious, and it's, I'm not sure how far that's gone. Some people question the ethics yeah. of doing it. Um, but. For it to work, you'd have to have all the potential consumers to fear that their bit of horn might be poisoned. And so you'd have to poison an awful lot, and if people die, um, that's a tricky one. So uh, <laughs> if we go down there. Uh, is it a good idea to crush ivory, or could it have some other use which could um, strengthen uh, elephant and, and rhino conservation likewise? Um, destroying stockpiles. Uh, I went from Born Free to Paris a few weeks ago to watch their destruction of three tons of ivory. They are going to do something creative, and French was a big pile of, of dust. And I think if you put it into an ornament, um, I thought in the past have crushed it and put it into an, a large hourglass and used it as a physical metaphor for the time running out of the openings. That sort of demonstration is perhaps helpful, but if you're thinking of an alternative as in don't crush it, let's sell it, make some money, we've been through that point. Um, the, the other thing was uh, perhaps not in Paris because you were there, um, but what we see in Asia is that if, let's say, Kenya or any other African country announces that they're going to burn 60 tons of ivory, um, guaranteed after the burning, uh, um, half of it shows up in Asia. Uh, uh, you see basically, uh, uh, so I think that burning is very, very good, but it needs to be sort of like properly checked. And people, if they say they're going to burn to, to, to destroy 60 tons of, of ivory, uh, someone needs to be there with, 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 with a, 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 a... Well, I was, I was just in Ethiopia um, about a month ago and physically counting the 6.1 tons and marking all the individual exactly. pieces and putting them all on iPads and then photographing every piece. And it's a, it's a ledger system. So you now know that when that storm is cleared out and all that ivory is destroyed, which they're going to do, yeah. it's all gone. Yeah. And we, and we have a physical record of every single, every single piece, actually, which is set So, Katie, mm. uh, I, I, well, before we do the raffle, um, mm -hmm. you're going to remind me to say something. No, well, no, I was just going to say it would be great if we could maybe continue some of this conversation online, because I think there are probably still lots of questions. And we have got the Facebook page um, that is on the event page. So if any of you perhaps want to ask questions, you can post them there, 
and I could try and pass those questions on through colleagues and perhaps some of our panellists and we could keep the debate going on social media. So if anyone's interested in that, that might be a nice way to continue the evening. Yes. Um, but yes, there are ten raffle prizes. Ten raffle prizes. Um, and I don't know how many people bought tickets. Hopefully more than ten. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a bucket over here. Um, so I made go along with our panel. And I think if you, if you, um, if you win, just come down and you can choose. Um, I think that's the simplest way rather than attaching a ticket to a... Um, um, it's blue, 79. <laughs>